Born in the shadow of communism, in the grip of poverty, in the cradle of post-industrial central Poland and Eastern Europe, Agnieszka Pilat acted on her burning desire to leave her homeland and headed to America in 2004. She landed in the Bay Area where a transformative book recommendation from her hairdresser and her industrial roots in Poland led to an epiphany which led her to start painting machines. First, the industrial kind, gears and widgets and meters and fire alarms. Then robots, one in particular, her big bright yellow 70 pound cybernetic pet, if you could call it that, slash model, slash assistant, slash apprentice spot on loan to her from the famed and controversial robot maker, Boston Dynamics. Hello everyone, this is When It Mattered. I'm Chitra Raghavan. Over the past decade, Agnieszka Pilat's classically trained, Renaissance-inspired contemporary art around man and machine, technology and automation has gained a big following among Silicon Valley elite billionaires. Her works of art have been acquired by collectors including Sotheby's and tech titans such as Craig Bacall, Richard Branson, Yuri Milner, and Larry Silverstein, among others. Several of her paintings are featured in the latest Matrix movie, The Matrix Resurrections. Pilat has been described as an artist who brings technology to life, the darling of Silicon Valley, and a technology storyteller. Her latest exhibition is titled Renaissance 2.0 and is an homage to Silicon Valley's renaissance. Joining me now to share a little bit about her life and her mind-bending conceptual art is Agnieszka Pilat. Agnieszka, welcome to When It Mattered. Hi, Chitra. It's very nice to be here. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing in post-industrial Europe in, in Poland. Uh, yes, sure. So I was born in 1973, which was still behind the Iron Curtain in a uh, city in central Poland, Lodz or Łódź, which had a history of uh, textile industry. In fact, uh, a big part of textile uh, um, garment district in New York were the Jews who actually came from my city. So it was a very multicultural place before World War II. Uh, it was still, my city was actually one third German, one third Jewish and one third Russian and Polish mixture. So when I was growing up, uh, you know, that industry already transformed a lot and a lot of factories were just abandoned. So I was in a place of uh, lots of ruins, ruins of technology, ruins of machines. Uh, and so I think that's why I'm so familiar among them. And your parents, at the time you were growing up, your parents were, were dealing with the consequences of communism. They weren't very well off. Uh, your life was a bit of a struggle, wasn't it? Uh, yes. So, uh, so yes. So when I was growing up, I mean, um, I was a, a very a young child when I think Poland was at its worst after, uh, during communism. So I think 81 was it was really a, real poverty. So I was not even 10 years old then. And uh, things like basic things like toothpaste, we did not have toilet paper, we did not have, we would, um, I remember as a child, uh, my mom would st always stand in line, my entire childhood was being in line, and, um, and comically or not, very often you get in line and you tap a person in front of you, and you ask him, hey, so what they have, and very often the person, well, I don't know, so you would just, no matter what, what there was in the stores, you would just always try to buy it, because also money had very little value. Uh, I remember um, not being able to buy anything privately. I have family, a lot of my family actually is from the countryside. And, but even if you had uncles or aunts who are farmers uh, in communist, we were not allowed to buy anything privately. So the government would keep track of what each farmer had. And so if they had 10 pigs, uh, they would come and they would force them to buy the pig for the government forced pricing. So obviously there was a lot of black market. And I in particular remember a story driving back from the countryside from my aunt and uncles. And we had an illegal pig in the trunk that they killed and they gave us. And I remember we, being, we were stopped by the police and thank goodness nothing happened, but we were praying, please don't, do not make us open the trunk because then we would be in real trouble. And so uh, food was hard to come by and money was in shortage. And, and so then what happened as you grew up? Did things change? Uh, yes. So, of course, yeah. Fast forward to 84, which was a lot of 
unrest was happening, kind of like Orange Revolution was happening in Ukraine recently. And, uh, and then 89, the Berlin Wall came down uh, and we opened up, the whole economy opened up. And it's remarkable how within 10 years, uh, Poland, which was such a poor country, transformed and the economy was starting doing really well. And personally for my family, so my mom was a gym teacher and my father was a pastry chef and he worked for a state owned bakery. Uh, but the Polish government did something really very clever. They allowed biz businesses to be bought out by people they worked for on pretty good terms. So my parents took a big risk and they bought up the bakery. And within a few years, it was just a total transformation. They worked very hard. I don't remember them taking a day off. And I remember my mother didn't have a driver's license and she would get on the bus with like strawberries and things to make cakes with. And my dad, interestingly, who, who struggled with alcohol my entire childhood during communism, because a lot of people did what they did, they, they did because they were so desperate, uh, he got he got just sober one day uh, because the business and the uh, ability to really work hard and see the fruit of your hard work that just really inspired him and was an amazing transformation personally for my family. That's incredible that he was able to literally just turn his back on alcohol and never return to it. What, what an incredible story. Uh, yes, I think the alcohol in, in communism, I think was very common because it was a really true sign of desperation. Uh, and, and really, truly, uh, yeah, it was, it was just really remarkable. And I remember growing up and my father, you know, struggling with alcohol. And uh, so, so that's why my, um, I have such love for free market and free economy, because for me personally, it was just an amazing story. And you were at the time studying French literature. You wanted to pretend you thought, why were you studying French literature? And, and why did you end up wanting to come to America? So I always, I think I had this itch to leave Poland. Uh, I think Poland was a bit too serious for me. And again, now it transformed somewhat, but again, the Nordic country in Eastern Europe. So people are very serious. There is very uh, limited uh, tolerance for failure or for being different. Uh, so, I, so I thought that knowing a foreign language from a Western country would be an opening for me to leave. And, uh, and I had a teacher who was a French teacher, and I really admired him, who was like a mentor to me. So that's why friend, I took that route of studying French, uh, because I thought I was going to live in Paris eventually. And then you, uh, you decided to come to the United States. Yes. So here's what happened. So I was so I was in Poland and I uh, um, I, I met someone as a very as a, as a teenager, really. So I was in the relationship and um, that was the time when multimedia was a very exciting time. And we had a startup, which we did together. Uh, so I was kind of tied up to that as a very young person, but also my my then boyfriend um, became really um we had a lot of issues and he was very, uh, he was not the right boyfriend for me, let's put it this way. So I so I was looking for a way out to come very far somewhere to a place when there was no direct flights and that place was California. That's how I ended up being in California. And of course, uh, another part of it was that, uh, you know, in Poland, we're extremely pro-American for us. America is this land uh, where your dreams can come true. So there was another reason for me to come um, to Silicon Valley uh, to kind of start over. And tell me what was the first thing that led you to, into the art world? Um, what, was, what, what was the moment of uh, impact for you? Uh, sure. So, you know, as a child, of course, I was I was I was doing art and the startup had a big uh, art co um, component to it. So I was doing graphic design and I but but ultimately what happened when I came to to the United States to uh, to San Francisco, uh, again, keep in mind, I'm coming from a from a background of a person who uh, grew up kind of you know, communism changing to free market economy. And I'm coming to San Francisco, which is a very liberal place in the sense that it's uh, really, uh, San Francisco likes big government. And for me, that was very confusing actually, because I was like, well, 
why like you like kind of you want the solutions that we had and failed in my country and why why you think these are good solutions so i I would talk about it a lot i was very confused what's going on in the politics especially in san francisco and then a hairdresser my fabulous friend a fabulous gay hairdresser who I loved he was he I would like rant to him and he recommended the book he's like you know what you should really read that book Atlas Shrug and I never heard about the book so I read the book and it had a tremendous impact on me Uh, and the main thing I took from the book was that uh, a person um, without a meaning is really not truly a human being so so being in America, I, I, I found a way, I figured out a way to tell a story about the economic part of uh, my upbringing, my experiences and paying service to America in that way, but also having a meaning as opposed to just, um, yeah, just kind of hanging out and um, yeah, not having a, a center in life. And, and so what did you do next? So... Um, so, so when I read that book, I thought it really, again, it really resonated. And I thought, well, it's such a good story. It's kind of white, black and white. There is evils and there is heroes. And I thought it would make a really good graphic novel. So I went back to school to study illustration with a purpose of making Atlas Shrug into a graphic novel. And then along the way, uh, here I am at school and I'm studying illustration. Illustration is very uh, computer digital uh, work. And I found more and more that I didn't like drawing on the computer. I wanted to go bigger. So I started taking more fine art classes, more painting classes, uh, and started painting very big and started painting figure. And I became really good at it. Uh, And along the way, I almost forgot about the graphic novel. And when I went to school and just became very focused, okay, can I be a very, very good painter? Uh, And when I graduated from school, I was approached by um, by someone who was an art collector. Um, he was a developer in Silicon Valley, uh, Paul Stein. And Paul really liked the way I painted, but he was not really interested in the figurative work I was doing. And he offered, well, why don't you come to my office? And I have different artifacts, different machines that I save from factories that we renovate. And why don't you come, maybe you find something and you can paint for me a painting from that. And so, and that changes everything. So I went to his office, I found an old um, fire bell that coincidentally was in the building that now is Airbnb headquarters. So that's about like, you know, uh, Silicon Valley and the full circle. And I painted the portrait of the bell and it all came back to me. Oh, I went to school because I wanted to tell the story of industry and heroism and uh, give service to America. Uh, and so that was the, the pivotal point for me. And it's really interesting to go back and trace your work on your website because the, the earliest art that I saw was you, uh, you told me that she's your niece and, you know, very traditional classic portrait of your niece, your young niece in like her ballet outfit, you know, her little tutu and her little uh, slippers. And it was just really interesting then to start to see all these machines come out of out of that next phase. Yeah, very feminine, right? So yeah, a big change. So what happened is, as, as a painter, I wanted to really do portraiture because this is like the pinnacle, the hardest thing you can do. Uh, and But then, you know, conceptually, uh, especially after meeting Paul, uh, I started thinking and I had a switch in my mind. Well, as a portrait painter, your job is really to show who has power in society. In other words, uh, portraiture is very uh, attached to patronage. So if you go to a museum, any museum in the world, you don't need to know anything about the history, but just by looking at portraiture, who was painted, who were the patrons of the arts, you can guess what class kept power in society. So of course, at first, very early art is always very religious. Then we had aristocracy. Then we might jump to wealthy Dutch merchants in Holland and so on. In America at some point, Andy Warhol with celebrity portraiture. 
Right now, I would say we are in the me society. So the number one portrait that being produced is selfies. This is where we are at. My childhood, growing up in Eastern Europe, you would see portraiture of working class, working men and women. And the future, which we are entering right now, the power lies in the machine. So what I do, I paint portraits of machines because they are my patrons. I work for the machine. You also describe machines as the aristocracy of the future. Yes, correct. So my dream, my, my dream is that... Um, the, the work that I'm creating now, which are again portraits of machines, and I did some old portraiture that you saw some ruins of machines and now more modern. Um, but the same way as I go to a museum today, I go to the Prado, let's say, or Hermitage, and I look at portraiture or aristocracy, I think these are my culture ancestors. And so my dream is that if artificial intelligence and intelligent machines, if they progress in the future, they will come to the museum of the future I'm building and they will look at these portraits and they're going to think these are my ancestors. And how did it, your work evolve to including robots? That is a really fascinating uh, piece of your art. And we'll talk about some of the individual examples, but how did you then uh, meet robots and say, you know, this completely fits in with my, uh, my ethos of how I see the world? Uh, yes, sure. So, yes. Yeah, so at first, uh, my, my, my first um, body of work, which were portraits of machines, I really liked painting rather insignificant machines. And they were kind of like unsung heroes that are doing the work for us. Uh, and, uh, and, then I, and then I, I was, um, I did a talk actually at Google X. Uh, I did a little, there was uh, women in technology and I did a couple of paintings there to celebrate uh, women's um, contribution to technology. And I was approached by the CEO of uh, Waymo, which is Google self-driving car by uh, John Kravchik. And John was really enamored of the way I painted. And so he was excited. He's, well, why don't you come to us to Waymo and look around and see if you like something that excites you and maybe you can paint a portrait of that. And everything kind of started from that. So I did a, so I did a portrait of, lay, of lighters uh, for Waymo. And that painting was acquired by Yuri Milner. John actually left since then. He's not the CEO anymore. Uh, and then, so this was the first new technology and it was a very learning experience for me because I used to approach the new technology like uh, the same way I painted old portraits. Uh, and what I mean by that, I mean by seriousness and color and uh, also mysticism. So my old portraits, they are painted in very gray tones. They're very serious, so kind of like a Rembrandt palette. And when you think about Rembrandt, who was the best portraiture in the world, he would choose old people to paint, right? Because, he's, he's, he, because an old person has history, has a lot of essence. It's very interesting. I suppose a baby, it's not that interesting. There's not much going on. So I was trying to find that essence uh, the same way from old machines and the new machines. And I encountered the problems because the new machines, like the new robots, they're kind of like teenagers. So they, they, so they started coming out a little arrogant and uh, just too serious. And I had to change the whole color palette uh, to, 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 yeah, to start the whole new body of work with these machines. And with particular, what happened with Boston Dynamics was I knew about um, the robot dog from Matthew Stepka and uh, I saw videos um, and, and I kind of were watching them and I was looking for a connection. Okay, how can I come in? So Boston Dynamics, they're, they're very secretive for a reason. And uh, I was trying to look, they don't have a program artist in residence. So I was looking for a connection. How can I find someone uh, to who would make an introduction? And an introduction was made by by, by a friend who's the CEO of uh, Analog Devices, Ray Stella, and Ray, Ray introduced me to someone there on their executive team. And I came in and I just asked, "Hey, could I just make one little painting?" And that one little painting, you know, turned out to be a a body of a full year of work and a show and now working with a robot. That's incredible. And you know, you've you've done this incredible, you've created this incredible twist by taking 
uh, some of the most famous Renaissance and modernist art and, uh, you know, with the classically tra trained uh, background that you have and, and put a really interesting spin on it by replacing man with machine. So let's talk about some of those examples. Uh, Vitruvian man, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, famous uh, uh, portrait. What, how did you put the twist on it? Yes, yeah, sure. So it all goes back to the reason and intention, what I'm doing, what I'm doing, which is I, I see myself really as a defender of technology and defender of American innovation. That's how that's how I define myself. So for me, uh, I, I, uh, I approach these new subjects like robotics at Boston Dynamics like Atlas, but I use the old language of painting. And, and, and I believe that by using that old language that's very familiar to people, uh, I take away the edge. I humanize these machines. They seem more familiar. They're more, they're not as foreign because people know painting, people are used to painting. So that's one reason. Another reason why I use a painting in a classical sense is also to give these machines uh, the dignity and uh, elevate them to high culture, which they should be a part of. So, so there's these two reasons. So I, I, there's a lot of artists who are who work who work with technology and they have a conversation about technology, but they are not necessarily using old language. They are very techy often. And I think for general public uh, to take away that anxiety that technology is coming, that it's gonna take away our jobs, that it's gonna be dangerous. Uh, I think using the old language softens this image Sometimes I talk about Hamilton, the musical, how uh, Emmanuel Miranda took new music, I mean, hip hop with old language. And I think there is beauty in the jazz. And so you also used some augmented reality in the Vitruvian Man, right? The, the, the robot can actually uh, move. Is that right? Yes, yeah, sure. So when I came here, so when I first came to uh, Boston Dynamics, the first painting I, I did there was Portrait of Spot. And when I saw Spot going up and down the staircase, in my mind, historically, I very instantly thought, okay, this is um, reminds me of the moment in history when Marcel Duchamp painting nude descending a staircase, which was a very innovative abstract painting back then. And I thought, okay, if I just come and paint a painting, just a portrait of the machine, it's kind of lame. I need to do some innovation. And that caused me to think, okay, I have to, I'm gonna try to use augmented reality, which I'm a big fan of. I think it has really future beyond art, of just really very gun ho on the whole concept. And I thought, uh, yeah, machines move. So it is an interesting way to solve the uh, paradoxes in my work, which is again, machines are moving objects and, and paintings are still. Also machines make noise, paintings are quiet. Another paradox is that machines uh, create produce mass mass objects and they're all the same. Me as a painter, if I do it by myself, if I'm painting, each painting is a little different, so they're original. And finally, machines don't have an author and art is all about the artist. So that's another paradox. And you, you also told me a very funny story the other day about how uh, your uh, take on Michelangelo's uh, famous section of the Sistine Chapel with the famous uh, God touching Adam's hands, uh, which everybody knows uh, how that came about. Oh, yeah. Oh, my, yes. So that's another part that so much I appreciate being guest at companies like Boston Dynamics. So I came and I was again painting just portrait of spot. But and back then they were developing the arm, which is a load uh, another robotic part that you can put on top of spot to do more to be to do certain actions and I did and so I finished the painting and then these two engineers come by come to me uh, they show up um, like a mouse like a cat excuse me like a cat with a mouse and showing to its owner look at that this is, isn't this the best thing ever and they're coming with an arm and they're very sad and they're like well how come you're not painting the arm and they're very disappointed they feel totally rejected so me out of kind of like okay i was like out of pity and sadness i'm like, okay i'll do the arm and that developed into the whole uh, other body of work and the painting came out really wonderfully 
it's yeah, it, it's uh, it's the gesture from Michelangelo, and conceptually makes so much sense. It's not human creating the robot, a robot creating a human. Would you see these images? But it's one robot creating another robot. Would you think this is the symbol of really the technology is also the new religion? So it's a very religious painting for me. You know, you we uh, you mentioned Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's uh, classic and famous and controversial novel, and. You know, the whole theme of that book is sort of what is the, that the role of the mind is is what dictates man's existence, right? The absence of mind, the absence of thinking uh, results in a failure, but it's really, you know, the sort of the villains are the people who defy uh, reason, they evade facts. And, and so there's this, uh, you know, conflict between themselves and reality and, and nothing gets done, right? So thinking is the basic virtue that that life needs. Um, you kind of see a lot of that ethos in Silicon Valley. Do you think that's, again, one of those themes that drew you to Silicon Valley? Oh, yes, absolutely. My whole work, everything is because I pay tribute to human mind. And I think Silicon Valley in particular uh, represents innovation, uh, curiosity, and also respect of reality, and especially with robotics. So, uh, you know, I like social media, which can be perhaps tweaked to pretend something that's not real. With robotics, robots have to really uh, honor the rights of nature, and it's really, truly complicated. So for me, mm, that's another part that I love being at companies is to have relationships with engineers because they they have amazing jobs, they make so much money, they have very safe life, but they really want to be seen for what they are doing, which is making the world a better place. So I come in with that to tell them that, and it comes really from an authentic place. Uh, it's, you know, being an artist, it's a very ridiculously hard career, uh, but I, 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 I draw so much meaning from the service. To, to, yeah, to engineers, to American industry, to the innovation that uh, I don't mind how hard it is because I have so much meaning in life and I always, I'm always so centered because I know what is the story I'm saying. And so I have this very wonderful relationship really with engineers and it's like so much joy from that. You know, Spot is uh, is your model. You paint Spot, but but Spot also paints. You've taught Spot to paint, and sometimes Spot paints on its own, and sometimes Spot is sort of an extension of you. How do you take a robot and teach it to paint and to and 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 what have been the results of that? Uh Sure, yeah. So that's an extension again of what happened with the engineers who just came and they were excited just to introduce me to the arm. So after I painted the portrait of the arm, the next step was like, why, why don't you play with it? Uh, so the arm is, uh, when I paint with the arm, I use uh, oil sticks. Uh, so and the, the work that I do with uh, with spot with the arm, they're 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 very um, abstract and simple and simple in a sense. And I like that conceptually coming from the place of uh, art history. I th when we think about these machines, they are really children. They are really in nascent stages of development. So just like children who do like finger painting, very simple, very self centered paintings. Uh, Spot also creates these works that are very, very childish and simplistic, but they're very, very, very honest also. And in a sense, for me, this is a bit of a back slap, uh, making fun of contemporary abstract art, which I think it's very decorative at this point, but historically it's hard to make find meaning in it. But when Spot does it, it's okay, because that's the best it can do. The way in, in terms of operating it, I really like operating manually. That's my favorite part of it. I don't do generative art. I, I, I it, it doesn't really interest me. But also, I can have a spot pre-programmed and do repeat the same painting over and over again, which is as machine it should. And you know, you mentioned that we we sh you know you have this romantic relationship with machines and that they are like our they are our children and we should be kind to them. But that's, you know, when you look at uh, robots, you know, Spot, obviously, you know, you take him for or take him or her or it for walks in the park, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and wearing a matching yellow outfit. But, uh, you know, part of the reason you do that is to make sure to reassure people that there's somebody there who is controlling what is a very big machine, essentially. And, um, you know, there's a very kind of different um, 
view prevalent in society today. You know, you've kind of seen all of the controversy around Meta and formerly Facebook with Google and artificial intelligence. You've had worker, you know, engineers walking out of Google over, you know, its relationship with the U.S. government around artificial intelligence. You've got self-driving cars that are very controversial in part, you know, they've run over people and it's something very hard to do. Um, and you've also had, you know, attack robots, including by Boston Dynamics, you know, the the, the counterpart of, of your very sweet uh, spot, um, you know, so one of them was even pulled from the New York Police Department after it was seen being deployed because people got so freaked out. So the question is, you know, we are seeing sort of the other side of what you're saying, which is kind of this dystopian society where potentially these robots, you know, there's this fear among even some of the top tech moguls like Elon Musk over artificial intelligence and what are we what are we creating? So I'm curious how you kind of reconcile those two things in your mind. Um, sure. So uh, first of all, I think um, I often like to come back to a very amazing speech by Roosevelt, uh, the man in the arena, which is in which where he shortly put uh, says it's easy to criticize, it's very hard to get into arena and get bloodied and try to solve the problems. So so I, so I think uh, technology is an easy target to criticize. Uh, so there is a lot of criticism that's un, um, undeserved. Now, that said, I think social media and robotics, I think these are two different things. I think social media deserves a lot of criticism. Robotics, I would compare it to what a car is. So, you know, fast for, I mean, back, um, rewind a hundred years from now when so many uh, people are, you know, horse and boogie drivers, uh, and then a car shows up, there is great fear about, well, people are gonna lose the jobs. Uh, cars are fast, they're gonna kill people. Uh, they make a lot of noise and so on. So, so I think it's natural that we are scared of change and progress. And I think because technology and innovation is always on the, excuse me, technology is always the forefront of innovation and expectedly it creates a lot of change. So technology became like a poster child for change, for criticizing, it's just for, for fear. Uh, and of course, some changes bring negative stuff. Uh, the, the, the Boston Dynamics, uh, uh, incident in New York, and just and I, I'm not a, like an official spokesman for Boston Dynamics, but of course I have a long relationship with them working together. Uh, well, the robot actually didn't do anything negative, but people were just not used to it. So it was a yes, yeah, So it they was were freaked really, out by it. <laughs> so yeah, so you bring that very strange-looking creature. You might call it uncanny valley a little bit because it's close. It kind of imitates nature, and you know, and it's painted blue. And there's already so much fear towards the police. And you take it to the Bronx. It just really was not a. It, it just it just really didn't work out. I understand I, I, that people were scared. I, I, I'm not criticizing that, um, um, but but again, it's I think technology just change uh, and it disrupts, of course. Uh, but that what creates progress. I mean, if we didn't want to have any technology, we wouldn't have skyscrapers. We would be living in little huts. Uh, so I'm pretty optimistic about technology and I don't, I rarely apologize for it really. Uh, and again, I, I work with machines, I, that's a different story, uh, social media or even AI, these biases, that's a different thing. But I think I, on purpose, I work with mechanical objects and these objects have to respect nature to operate in nature. So they're very authentic in that sense. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. And you know, just to just to kind of extend these these this theme a little bit, you know, when when you told me that you were, uh, you were you grew up in the 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 city of of town of Lodz in Poland, I kind of just did a search on it just to see you know what it was like when you were growing up, and I, I found that it's actually the city for a famous novel called The Promised Land in English, uh, written in 1899 by the Polish author and Nobel laureate Vladislav Raymond and it was considered one of like his most 
most important uh, works. And it's actually a, an interesting story about like these three very ruthless industrialists and they're trying to build a factory. And essentially it's a denunciation of industrialization. And the author kind of describes industrialization and its labor exploitation as a tumor on the promised land that, that was situated in Lodz in his novel. Uh, and he said, you know, Villages were deserted, forests died out, the land was depleted of its treasures, the rivers died out, dried up, people were born, and it sucked everything into itself. And in its powerful jaws, it crushed and chewed up people and things, sky and earth, in return giving useless millions to a handful of people and hunger and hardship to the whole throng. And I was so struck by that, just these themes of industrialization and technology and the power of, of machines over humans. And do you think someday that like a novel will be written about this similar kind of impact on technology that that is as kind of eviscerating as Ramon's. I know you said that you were, you're, you are very optimistic, but I'm just curious, given that this was written by a Polish author, what do you make of it? Uh, sure, yeah, I know the novel, and there's also a great book uh, made from that novel, it's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Uh, I think, well, first of all, I think what I like about United States is there is there is room for everything and different lifestyles and so on. So I think like America has very rural rural areas still, and they're very protected. And then there's places like New York City, which is totally on steroids. So I think it's important as people, we have a choice to do one on the other, as opposed to um, again, I'm going back to communism in Poland, but having that central government just really dictating you, what do you do? doesn't matter on a farm or in a factory, you're being dictated. So I think having a lot of diversity, it's so important. And I think Silicon Valley also represents that diversity in many ways, but also because there are so many immigrants, so they bring such different ideas. Uh, the, 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 I do, I think that technology, that as human beings, uh, we make machines to, uh, to accomplish our dreams. In fact, every time a man has a dream, he builds a machine. And of course, the Wright brothers with the plane, that's the most uh, iconic example of it. And also because these problems are so difficult, going to Kennedy's quote, it's because the, the, the things are so difficult, that's what we do as human beings. And that also makes us create teams and cooperate and build cities, uh, as opposed to you know living in a village when everyone has their own little pl plot of land and everyone looks suspiciously of the neighbor because uh, there is no need for a cooperation. So I think innovation and building machines and also building on the knowledge from generation to generation, it's particular in technology, we see that, and that's what gives me great optimism for technology and machines. And again, there's moments in history, and I've seen this, of course, in Eastern Europe and in Poland, like in coal mining, it's a horribly dirty uh, part where Poland gets its energy and it has its problems. Uh, now, if there is innovation, that's just generally the transition point that goes away in time. But as human beings, machines are just part of our ecosystem. Technology is a part of ecosystem. I don't think they're foreign to us. They're not, they're not foreign to Earth. And they're also, um, they're not superior to us. We are not superior to them. They're just our brothers in arms. Because again, the machines are just ideas made concrete. So they represent, I like to say, they're our children. You describe Silicon Valley elites as sort of the new Rockefellers, and you know you've got now some really powerful patrons. And how does it feel to sort of hobnob uh, with these billionaires and have them showcase your art? You know, you, you know, given where you came from. Uh, well, it's very exciting because uh, again, like I grew up without toilet paper, so it's a very different lifestyle <laughs> to be on on the, on the, on the boat. Uh, you know, private planes, all that. So it's very different. So I'm very, uh, I appreciate these experiences very much and I'm very humble. I, oh, I'm always the poorest person in the room because I am an artist. So these are all my patrons. Uh, they are, they've been really wonderful to me. Um, you know, they operate a little differently and it's interesting for me to see how much uh, people think how big their impact can be. And it's really actually wonderful and very inspiring. So uh, it's, no, it's, I mean, it's great fun. I'm just always, you know, sometimes they're just confused. They don't understand like where I come from perhaps. 
Uh, so sometimes we speak a different language, uh, but it's a great privilege. And for me also is again, you know, growing up in Poland and looking at America and these industrialists and a little bit of Ayn Rand, they, they kind of represent what I think America is. And I'm just like the plus one uh, uh, in service to tell their story. Uh, and it's been wonderful to me. You know, the role of the artist is definitely not to be nice, right? But to be controversial and it's not to appease, but to incite and to arouse and to make people think and to kill political, excessive political correctness, to kind of force unconventional thinking, uh, to instigate revolutions, right? Both of the intellect and sometimes against oppressive regimes. And in a, in a weird way, right? Silicon Valley moguls of today are kind of doing just that, right? And that's why they are like, painful sometimes to 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 read about and and deal with and to see the impact of the technology that they built that they probably even didn't realize would have that kind of power if you, if you look at Facebook and and other companies like that you know so in a weird way your ethos ethos of you know forcing people to think about these things is very much aligned to to your patrons well yes but i would say i would i would contradict you saying that as an artist i'm in a pretty unusual place because i think that's what you said artists are on the it, it is often on the surface so we have some very big important movements right now uh in culture and they leak into art right we all know this there is a uh, um, there is environmental movement. There is the there is the um, diversity of equality for different uh, sex uh, groups. There is the BLM movement, and a lot of artists do that. You know, when I come and I come, what I do by by being embracing uh, technology that creates so much fear right now and, and and anxiety, and by having a positive image about it, I am not very liked by certain curators. And especially New York has been interesting to me. So I moved to New York a couple of years ago. I still have a studio in Silicon Valley, but I spend a lot of time in New York. And I've noticed uh, New York has a lot of anxiety, curiosity, and obsession about the money in Silicon Valley. And there's a uh, there's certain amount of... Um, resentment from cultural institutions because they are used to, you know, patronage. And that's why I am in New York, because New York has a different culture of, of patronage. In, in San Francisco or in Bay Area, it's complicated. There is people who have a lot of money and they are not art patrons because it just, they're too young. It's not their thing. So I love that in New York, but also, you know, I've been, um, one of my friends who is a, who is a curator, and he, he told me in the past, oh, that I drank the Kool-Aid because I'm hanging out with these wealthy tech um, people and that I am betraying art. So I am actually really on the outskirts on, 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 on the, of the art world in that sense. How do you feel about that? Well, it saddens me in a sense. I mean, on one, on one hand, I know what I'm doing is authentic. Uh, again, uh, it all comes back to my childhood. I, 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 I have values that are uh, very centered in that story. Uh, I love heroes, and for me, heroes are Silicon Valley, um, uh, you know, uh, technology people. They are heroes for me. But of course, I, I do. Um, I am an artist, so it's important for me to be acknowledged in the art circles. Uh, and even though that gives me a position of power, having these co collectors, you know, ultimately, I, I want to be more. I had the conversation. I wish there was more curiosity. I wish New York, that culture had more of a, what is New York scared of? The little peninsula down on the, like on the West Coast, like they shouldn't be scared of it. So I was very surprised with certain art critics here that they have that fear uh, and that like I became a symbol of that a little bit. So that saddens me. Like I wish, I wish there was more curiosity and openness towards technology and uh, and, you know, and acknowledging them morally because a lot of innovation made our lives much better. You liken working with Spot uh, to like like celebrity portraits, like Andy Warhol's up celebrity portraits. What are some of the other celebrity machines you're doing portraits of or working with? Uh, sure. So, uh, so I mean, Waymo, the, the, the lighters were very important too. The very important technology is less sexy in a sense that we doesn't have that there's nothing like Boston Dynamics, of course. I mean, Boston Dynamics is huge. And um, then there's SpaceX. So uh, that might be the next thing I'm doing. I'm, I'm not at, at, um, at freedom to talk about that yet. But the rockets, I think, are the next 
very uh, sexy celebrity technology now that's very exciting. I think the whole space uh, race right now is happening. A lot of 3D printing also. There is some companies I'm looking at. And there's another amazing robotics company uh, that I am talking to and hopefully I can come visit them. Uh, they are uh, Agility Robotics. Uh, they're on the West Coast and they are Carnegie Mellon Engineers uh, startup. And uh, it's a pretty amazing robot. So I would really like to uh, um, to paint a portrait of uh, one of the robots. Your next project is revolving around NFTs. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so NFT has been a very hot topic for the last two years, I guess now, kind of a, uh, the result of uh, accelerated because of the pandemic. Uh, so I am both excited about the NFTs and have some reservations towards it. Um, I'm excited because it's innovation, uh, it's tied to technology. There's some amazing minds working on it. So, uh, so I think um, I'm 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 doing a project where uh, I'm gonna have the robot create work, and then we're gonna actually have physical part attached, physical paintings attached to actually robot made paintings. And then when when fun part for me, the, the big part of an NFT is actually the blockchain part of it. That's exciting. And but what I mean by that, so we're gonna do one piece and then it's gonna be digitally cut up. I think we're gonna, we might do 18 or, or 36 pieces. And when each piece is sold as an NFT, then actually I'm gonna cut the actual canvas also in 36 pieces. And I'm gonna send them off to people who own the NFTs. And the idea is to create this community that people, it's in their interest that everything sells. So when it comes together, they can get an actual physical piece of it. So, so I like the, it, I'm very, I'm a lot, there's a lot of discomfort for me with the NFTs uh, because normally when you have a conversation about art, you, you talk about collecting. When you talk about NFTs, people talk about trading. So that part, that money part of NFTs, it's annoying to me, but I think if Andy Warhol were alive, I'm sure Andy would do it and would just think it's a fun game. So that's why I'm going into it. You know, I want to sort of uh, move away a little bit from art and talk a little bit about Ukraine, given your childhood growing up, you know, in the shadow of communism in Poland, which is becoming a, a very important country for helping refugees fleeing Ukraine uh, from the Russian war uh, uh, on them. Uh, and also just seeing, you know, y y I'm sure you have strong um, opinions about the former Soviet Union and now Russia, given uh, that you directly saw the impact of communism. What do you make of what's happening in Ukraine today? Um, yeah, no, it's very, it's, yeah, it's really uh, very sad. Uh, so um, I, I'm not surprised because again, when, you know, growing up in Eastern Europe, uh, we've been invaded a lot by, by Russians, the, 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 the Russian empire that's, historically that's what happens a lot that you know it always tries to expand especially to the west and to the south so my mom that i talk to uh daily uh who is in poland uh she for a long time when when, when putin was amassing troops uh i i always thought it was just economical that he wanted to really crush um ukraine economically by creating that image of a country that's unstable but she she was like really always saying no the war is coming the war is coming. So there's no surprises there because again, that's what they've been doing. I wish Russian people, I'm very, I'm very proud of Polish people that they are open their borders so much. It's just really amazing. And I think it comes from the place that they understand because we've been through that. When I, when I paint, I listen a lot to audiobooks actually. And there's a great audiobook that I listen to. It's called Bloodlands, History of Europe between Hitler and Stalin. And it really talks about Ukraine a lot. And what's ironic and sad about Ukraine is that this is the land that feeds Russia and feeds Europe, but it's also the land that the wars always start. So it's always the victim. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, I, I wish I'm, I'm very it, it's, it's amazing to see the Russian people protest, uh, come to the streets. And I know how dangerous it is they get arrested. It, it's really I mean, I grew up in a regime like that, too. Uh, but I, I think they need to do more. So ultimately, as much as I, I, I'm very uh, grateful that Poland is a part of NATO and then Americans have been doing so much, it's been amazing. Uh, 
that said, I do think it's the Russian people's responsibility to topple that regime. So, so, so I wish they did more. I, I wish they were on, on a strike. I wish the whole country went on strike because it's only numbers uh, that they can topple that regime. It's just not enough. They need to do more. And when you see all those, you know, the destruction that's being uh, wreaked, you know, by the Russians and, and Ukraine's defense and the absolute, you know, crushing of tanks and, and, and uh, you know, the artillery firing and, and all of this stuff going on and planes being shot down. And it's just extraordinary the amount of this uh, military litter that's going to occupy the space when it's all over. You know, it's sort of, again, a different vision of machines. I, I'm curious what you're thinking about that. Yes, sure. Uh, so uh, yeah, first, I think, again, Ukrainian people, oh my God, the amount of courage is just um, unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, it might be a cliche what I say, but machines are just tools, honestly. They're just tools. So in the wrong hands of the wrong people, they're just become very dangerous. But so is a knife, of course. I, I think I am, again, I'm optimistic about machines because ultimately, and we're seeing this in Russia, how incompetent they are, that army, uh, and how, you know, uh, Ukrainians with much smaller army, but because they are they're driven morally, they have a moral center, how much more they can do. So ultimately, the good always wins. And, and I think I saw that also in communism that, you know, factories and technology that all fall apart, because if you if you don't have a free mind, if you make minds to be prisoners to a system, these, the minds will stop working. And, and then you will have free minds, like again, Silicon Valley, that you are allowed to fail. Of course, I saw that a lot of this at the uh, at Google X, uh, Astro Teller talks a lot about this, how the failure, how having the courage to do crazy ideas, how important that is. And of course it comes, you know, there's more financial backing and all that. But, but the bottom line is I think the Russian minds, they are so um, um, closed and they are so persecuted that you can't really that's just that's what just so they're just might over mind, right? So that's what Russia is doing. Yes, Agnieszka, as we wrap up this uh, this really fascinating conversation, um, I have a couple of questions. One is, looking back on your younger self, what would you say to that person about the journey that you've been on? Uh, you know, the person who left Poland after growing up in poverty and then uh, came to America and, and began this really interesting relationship with machines. What would you say to your younger self? Oh, uh... uh... I guess dream big and it's gonna be okay. And uh, yeah, just just commit to something, I think. Just commit to something. And it's not more about, uh, yeah, don't try to be happy, but try find something meaningful and um, just go for it and it's gonna be okay. And what would you say to Ayn Rand if you walked into your hairdresser, you know, the one who recommended <laughs> Atlas Shrugged, <laughs> and she happened to be getting a haircut at next seat over? What would you say to her? Well, I would thank her because she did have a lot of impact positive in my life. But then I would also tell her, uh, we can't do it all alone. We need cooperation with others. And I think that's the biggest flaw in her books. Agnieszka, thank you so much for joining me on When It Mattered and for this amazing conversation. Thank you for your question. It's been so much fun. Thank you. Over the past decade, Agnieszka Pilat's classically trained, Renaissance-inspired contemporary art around man and machine, technology and automation has gained a big following among Silicon Valley's elite billionaires. Her works of art have been acquired by collectors, including Sotheby's, and tech titans such as Craig McCaw, Richard Branson, Yuri Milner, and Larry Silverstein, among others. Several of her paintings are featured in the latest Matrix movie, The Matrix Resurrections. Pilat has been described as an artist who brings technology to life, the darling of Silicon Valley, and a technology storyteller. Her latest exhibition is titled Renaissance 2.0 and is an homage to Silicon Valley's Renaissance. This is When It Mattered. I'm Chitra Raghavan. When It Mattered is a podcast from Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with brand strategy, positioning, and narrative. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions, with production assistance from Kate Cruz. 
Our creative advisor is Adi Weinland, and our research and logistics lead is Sarah Muller. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Join us next week for another episode of When It Mattered. I'll see you then.